Okay, folks, uh, welcome back to the afternoon session at the DNA workshop. And a uh, big thank you again to Family Tree DNA for, uh, for sponsoring the workshop and also to the ISOG uh, volunteers for manning the ISOG stand, International Society of Genetic Genealogists, and also the Family Tree DNA stand. So we're going to hear from Julia Bell. Now, uh, Julie, Julia was originally an English and history graduate and has appeared on uh, Discovery UK this spring as the genetic genealogist on a documentary about babies left in public places. And on the 5th of April, 1945, as we shall hear, a very strange thing happened. And Julia is going to tell us all about it. So please give a big warm welcome to Julia Bell. Hello, everybody. Well, the title of the presentation, I set the strange affair of the mystery on the baby at King's Cross. But also, Alfred Hitchcock's The Lady Vanishes seemed appropriate because, as you'll see as I go through the story, the lady does indeed vanish. So, we actually managed to solve half of the story with DNA. But as I go through and to explain the story itself, my what I'm trying to explain here is without DNA, we wouldn't be able to solve these stories at all. And this is just one example. There are many others. So I'm going to take you through. First of all, what I want you all to do is to don your dear stories, think very carefully, and I'm going to tell you a story that happened 72 years ago, almost to the day. There was something very strange that happened at Summons Town House, St Pancras, King's Cross. It was reported in the Camden New Journal at the time, in some detail. And I thought at the time, well, you know, how much can we trust this source? Because we have to look at our sources when we're investigating things and wearing our detective hats. But I'm told by journalist friends that this actually would have been well, they would have been fairly accurate, actually. They would have really checked their sources, and they would have really interviewed the people that you're about to hear about in the story very carefully. So I'm going to tell you the story, then I'm going to tell it again, but I want to see how many of you, and if any of you have any ideas, how many of you have any, any thoughts and ideas about what might be slightly strange about it, or might be slightly off. And if any of you have any ideas at the end, as to how we can move towards Linda's mother, or if there's anything that strikes you, then please, please do let me know. So, this is what happened. On the 5th of April, 72 years ago, almost to the day, what I want you to do is to imagine yourselves looking opposite at the station outside. So you have a lady called Mrs. Sears. It's very early in the morning, and she was resting. She was resting in her sitting room. I'm not sure of the timing, but as you see as we go through, that's probably an important point. So what she's doing is she's looking out of her window. And as she looks out of her window, she sees a lady walking backwards and forwards in a very agitated manner. And she's looking very uncomfortable. But she's wearing gloves, she's wearing a hat, and this is King's Cross. King's Cross, some pamphlets actually. And at that particular time, Summers Town House, this was, well, it wasn't a very salubrious area, let's say. Um, so she was a bit of an anomaly, and maybe that's why she stood out to Mrs. Sears. She was definitely looking, looking very uncomfortable. So Mrs. Sears said to her husband, do you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to go across and I'm going to go and speak to this lady and see if we can help her. So it's probably a first floor flat. So she goes down the stairs and she goes across to this lady outside the station that's walking up and down, carrying her baby. And she says, excuse me, um, would you like some help or is there something, something wrong with you? Oh, you know, can I, can my husband and I help? And she said, oh, I hate to be a bother, but you know, I've come down on the train from Peterborough this morning and you can't give me a kettle of hot water for my baby, can you? Um, and the lady says, of course I 
Japan. Yes, you know, we can help you. Please do. Please come with me. And so, with that, Mrs. Sears follows this lady, well, this lady follows Mrs. Sears, I should say, into, the, into this house, into these flats. Now, these flats were um, public housing, council flat housing, and these were sort of class-bound times. So just to, to keep that in mind, you know, would, would that really have happened as, as it's being described? And she says, my husband's on the 9.15 from Edinburgh. And then, so we've got that bit of information. So Mrs. Sear, in very English traditional, since time immemorial, says, would you like a cup of tea? I can make you a cup of tea. Well, I'll make the hot water for the baby and we'll all sit down and we'll have a chat. So they all sat down in the sitting room and they had a, they had a chat. And then Mrs. Sear said, well, to Mrs. Sears, our mystery lady says, I need to book a room in a Russell Square hotel. She, pointed, she spoke about this particular hotel in Russell Square. Um, I'm meeting my husband on the train from Edinburgh later, and I need to book a room in the Russell Square hotel. Can you tell me where this Russell Square hotel is? So they exchanged directions and she explained. Then at this point, Linda Wright, who is the lady that approached me, and the lady that this story is about, the lady that vanishes is her mother. So she's lying as a small child at this point, the baby, and Mrs. Sears says, your baby is sleeping. I tell you what, why don't you leave her with us? You leave her with us. You've had a, a difficult morning. You've had your cup of tea. Why don't you now go off to Russell Square and leave her with me and my Mr. Mr. Sear and I she'll be perfectly safe. So, off she goes. Now, the information that we've had so far, just to recap, is, so this mysterious lady has come in, she's accepted the hospitality of Mrs. Sear, she's had a cup of tea, Mrs. Sear has suggested that she leave her sleeping baby there. And what she's got to do at this point is, she has to, well, she's going to go and book a room in, in, in Russell Square. And then her husband's, her husband, she says, is coming from Edinburgh and he's coming in on the 9.15 and he's coming into King's Cross. So Mr. Sear, at this point, they, they let the lady go. They look after little baby Linda as she's, no names have been exchanged. We just know this later. This is not in the article. So they're looking after the baby. And then Mr. Sear begins to get a little bit well, half an hour's gone by, that's it, I'm going to King's Cross, he says. So off he goes to King's Cross at this point. After half an hour, Mr. Sear goes to King's Cross, there's no sign of the mystery lady. She has vanished, the lady has vanished completely. So, they are interviewed by the police. Mr. and Mrs. Sear say, well, this lady, she certainly fooled us. She was well dressed and well spoken. We had absolutely no idea at all what she intended to do. So, who was the mystery woman? So now I'm just going to run through you very quickly and just say a few things that struck me about this particular story and whether or not we can use that to inform our detective work as we go forward and we use DNA as well. Uh, there may be other things that can struck you and can help us as we move forward, so if there are, please let me know. But I hate to bother you. I wonder whether you can give me a kettle of hot water to feed my baby. Well, this was 1945. A year later, 1946, you've got Trevor Howard and Celia Johnson in brief encounter. The whole thing set around what? Was it set around? Well, a waiting room. Uh, in there, well, not completely, but you've got the station, you have the waiting room. And of course, they're usually a refreshment. So a middle-class lady that's well-dressed and she could go and ask there at the cafe or the waiting room or there probably would be some sort of facility where if she were desperate to feed the baby and that were the main thing, where she could, could do that, I would think. Also, there's something about the timings here. Mrs. Sear, very early in the morning, is sitting there and resting, apparently. So I'm not really very clear. Her husband's on the 9.15 from Edinburgh. 
car. What time is it now? She has quite a lot to do. She's got to go and book the room in Russell Square Hotel. Um, so that's strange, perhaps. So also taxes. Taxes would have been, as far as from my research that I can tell, if you know differently, please tell me. But they were probably taxes. And somebody, moneyed, well dressed, dark happy, may I mean it may not have been that simple to get a taxi. But it was quite a long way from this flat to Russell Square, as I'll explain as we go forward. So why not just jump into a taxi and off and off we go? The next thing that struck me um, as being slightly strange was your baby is sleeping, why don't you leave her here with us? Now this wasn't the mystery woman that was suggesting this. This was the couple themselves. So I don't know about you, but I would be very worried about leaving uh, my baby with a big stranger. Um, and also perhaps odd, if this is accurate reporting, that Mrs. Sear has suggested it and not the mystery woman, if that makes sense. Then the man says, after half an hour, that's it, I'm going to King's Cross. Well, it's half an hour in one direction to Russell Square. This lady has got to go and meet her husband from the train. Has got to probably, these, these, these hotels in Russell Square doing, you know, um, the research that I've done, were completely being requisitioned by the troops. So you had World War II servicemen going in there. So you probably have to queue up for a bit. So if it's really only after half an hour, why is he, why is he getting so agitated? And why is he giving up on that? And also, why is he thinking that he's been deceived? Why would you think that a woman like that would deceive you? This was the war. Okay, it was the tail end of the war, but it was the war nonetheless. So I don't know about everyone here, but my first thought would be, this woman's met with an accident. She's been in a war, she's had to go to an air ridge. I mean, of course, you would hear if there was a siren going on, but it's just something about this that strikes me. And why did he go to King's Cross when didn't she say she was going to Russell Square to be, you know, so assuming all of this, taking this at face, face value, it seems that there is more to this story. As I said, she certainly fooled us. So they're just not thinking about a mishap in any sense of the word at all. They're just imagining. We did not realise that she intended to do this when I think for most people, that would almost be not the first conclusion you drew, but perhaps the last conclusion that you drew after you've been, you know, striking mentally off all the all the other things that may have happened. So, solving mysteries with DNA. So the next stage is what do we do now? Linda's come forward to me. Who is the baby in the story? There are so many other cases like this, this one, that are now being solved with DNA. We have the autosomal DNA databases have tripled in two years or something to that extent and they're just getting ever bigger. The more people are on them, the more people with unknown parentage mysteries really can begin to solve some of these mysteries. I've heard, well, we've got what we call the big three, family tree DNA, here today sponsoring the tour, of course, on one database, then we have 23andMe, which is another, and then we have Ancestry DNA, which is the third. So for anyone that's trying to solve any of these cases or help people, if somebody comes to us, what we do is we ask them to test or to get their DNA onto all three of the key players, the big three. And then what we do is we look for genetic matches to the people concerned that are already on the database. And it doesn't have to be an immediate relative that's on there in order for us to do our work. The parts that DNA is in us, we can match back to five to seven generations and they will share a small amount with ancestors even that far back in time. And then we can work trees forward and we can do our, we, we can we can really work magic, except it's not magic. So for people like Linda in the story, there are solutions and there are things we can do. But more about that as I move forward. Now, I had the idea that Linda's father was an American GI. So for probably 20, 20 years or so, I've been involved with finding American GIs. So there's not much I don't know about finding American soldiers in World War II. 
originally through paper trails, working with a gentleman called um, Neil Sussblatt in uh, Missouri in the National Personal Record Center. My mother didn't know who her father was, and that's how I got into all of this, and he himself was an American GI. So that's the connection and the link there. And Andrew Bush, who's with us here in the audience, um, who is a brilliant gen uh, genetic genealogist, and I, I don't say that lightly, um, helped me with finding my grandfather, my unknown grandfather, Arthur Garrett. And in working with Angie through that time, I learned so much from her. And I thought, well, this is fantastic. I can actually help people like the mysterious, well, this whole mysterious case in the soul uh, because of what I've learned. And Angie is very patient with me and, uh, and puts up with me when I ask her questions. And it's very much, yes, Julia, no, Julia, maybe Julia. But I know, I know when she says yes, Julia, I know I'm ecstatic because I know that we really are, we really are going to get there. So that, that's good news. And as she will, I think, agree, I'm incredibly tenacious with these things. And I just keep going and keep going. And I'll come back to more of those as we move forward. So Linda's, um, Linda's father being an American GI, I knew he was an American GI. Now, I'm not a clairvoyant, um, but I, the reason was there's some logic there. Her conception so she was probably a couple of months old when she was left or so and i suddenly had this thought you know what i think i think that she was conceived around d-day and i know because i've done all of this work finding american servicemen they say that something like there were a hundred thousand children born to american from you know, fathered by american servicemen born to english ladies british ladies in world war ii I think the number is higher than that. I think it's more like 200,000 or 150,000. The illegitimacy rate in 1945 was something like 9.8%. I think that between 9.5 or 9.8 off the top of my head. That's quite high. Um, and I think it was driven mainly, I mean, mainly by American servicemen. But also, I don't know, um, it, it would be, this isn't scientific, but I think because I'm being very, uh, very proudly a quarter southern myself. I begin to spot southern ladies now when I see them in, in front of me. It, it might be a sort of unique mix of the you know, ethnicity estimates that I've seen, but there's a bit of Great Britain in there, there's a bit of um, sometimes Finland or the Scandinavian countries, Irish. It's a kind of heady mix, but anyway, just looking at her, I have this feeling, and also based on the, the possible conception date. At my house in Berkshire, I have three meetings a year for families, people that don't know who their parents are, and American GIs. They all come together and the, the children can mix in a kind of confidential environment. We have lunch, I do a talk. Um, and I met Linda here and I said, we're going to get you tested, Linda. And your father's an American GI. But anyway, just keep that in, in mind. So I found him. I found Carl Derman. And I think I found him with, within a couple of days of Burning the Midnight Mile, which genetic genealogists know all about that. Um, we all age about 10 years in a year because we're up there till 3 in the morning, 4 in the morning, 5 in the morning, uh, not sleeping, trying to work this data. Um, we ha I had sort of third cousin matches, uh, in this case on the Ancestry DNA database, and I was able to begin to look for correlations, beginning to begin to look for shared great, great grandparents in this case, and begin to look for patterns and begin to look for boots on the ground in, this, in, the, in the, the right time, at the right place. And I thought, I think it's this man, I think it's Carl Dernan, um, based at Earl's home in Essex. And the funny thing about this is that Linda um, was adopted eventually, after she'd been handed over, um, and was uh, to the police and then, then formally then fostered and then adopted. Um, she came from that area, which was, which was quite uncanny. But anyway, we need a bit more proof than that. So I found a half-brother, which would have been a half-brother, called Clyde Dern, uh, through DNA. And I, I managed to persuade him to do an answer to the DNA test. Um, and he very kindly obliged. And there he is as um, a child. Um, and it bears quite a, a strong resemblance. Not that you can um, always, and we say as genetic genealogists, or anyone involved in this, you can't, place too much, um, uh, you can't say because someone looks like someone else, of course they're genuinely related. If you, anyone knows only fools and horses, you only need to look at Delvoy and Rodney to, 
to see that a lot more, you know, the genetics can, uh, can fool us. Um, so we came, when the results came in, yes, absolutely, I have that close family relationship there, and it's fantastic. I am able to connect this baby with, in 1945, with six, six half siblings. One surprise half sibling, which I'm going to come to, Carl's English wife. Yes, Carl was married um, at the time that Linda was being left with the series to an English lady. Uh, here she is in the picture. And I thought at the time he was married. I wonder if, I wonder if Linda is the child of the English wife. I could see, and when I looked through the DNA results, I found the American father very quickly. I didn't think this was someone that had too deep rooted American parents or anything along those lines. And I knew it was an English wife, but obviously I didn't know anything about her at this time. I needed to do more investigations. So, Linda has a half sister called Carol. Now, Carol was born at the same time as Linda. So I thought, I had this moment where I thought, Linda is Carol. Oh my goodness, that's at like three in the morning, head in hands, head against desk, head against computer. This is extraordinary because I found her birth record. I knew we had Carl Derman, I knew he was married, and now I had a baby born the same time as Linda, Carol. And um, this is Carol in this picture, uh, not Linda, and I, I'll come to how we got to Carol. But Carl Dernan and these Americans were characters. Believe me, I've met so many of them. It feels like I've known them all so so well over the years. And they all had, had they all had big personalities. And I think you have to remember that many of them were facing death, and they thought they were going to die. And there was an awful lot of high spirits and all sorts of things that were going on. So Carl Dernan, how he managed to do this, I have absolutely no idea. But this is a newborn. So you have to imagine, he's with his English wife, he's obviously got someone else pregnant in, you know, in parallel somewhere. But he thought, wouldn't it be wonderful if we find a gooseberry bush? So they found a gooseberry bush near the hospital. He managed to get all the staff out of the hospital, as only a GI can, and mock up a finding a baby under a gooseberry bush for prosperity and the family album. And that's exactly what he did. So that was Carl Dernan managing to persuade nursing staff to go outside into a gooseberry bush somewhere in Essex and to pretend to find a baby. I mean, you can't imagine nursing staff today being quite so accommodating. Um, I'm mentioning now, in other cases, I'm, I'm still staying on with the story, but why DNA? If Linda had been a man, we would have been able, we would have had something else that we could have done. We could have tested why DNA which is from father to son, you know, passing down the generations to generations, which would have given us an extra bit of information. And one of my other cases I have, we've been looking for Gail Robinson, American, uh, raised in an orphanage in Pennsylvania, um, went down the mines, we've got all the stories and the letters from mum, reams and reams of it, except he's not Gail Robinson at all. He is a Dugway, a biological Dugway, uh, genetic community ancestry has put, pl placed him firmly as one of the early settlers in Quebec. We have all the information. That isn't quite what we were um, expecting to do. And just as I'm working the Linda case, I ask people and approach them to see if I'll test for us. So all of these people that are hits on the Y database in this particular case are all due ways. Um, and it proves basically that the um, autosomal connections I'm seeing are actually in his paternal side of things, and he is actually descended from Ch uh, Charmaine Dugway and Ursula Le Lazare, I think is the, the other the lady involved in it. But I know who, who you know the patriarch is here and back, um, and who he descends from. So I'm now going to be able to have a lot more information in order to crack this particular case. So if Linda had been a man, there would have been um, a bit more I could have done. So going back to the story. Peter Bar. So, this lady that I thought might be 
actually Linda's mother and all of the rest of it and Carol, I discovered uh, that, that no, he basically, he went AWOL from the base, Carl Dern, in June, um, around the time that Linda was conceived. So it might be when he went AWOL, he went to Peterborough or something. And the reason that I say he went to Peterborough is he, um, it looks like, it looks like, and I can't be 100% certain at the moment, but it looks like Linda's uh, mother is descended from a gaunt waller um, couple that were born sort of 1868 and 59, that sort of time. I think she may be a descendant of this particular couple that are rooted in Peterborough. I need to do a great deal more work. This is all at the early stages. But I know when I'm looking at the databases that many of them still are deep rooted in America. So if, you know, if I'm seeing uh, people who consistently descend from people with deep roots in Peterborough and around that area, that may not be coincidence. So it's unlikely to be coincidental. So I will need to source and find some descendants of this couple, get them to DNA test, and then I can see whether I can prove this hypothesis. And I need to do a great deal more work with building trees at this particular time. But what I'm trying to say to you is when you, if you're trying to crack some sort of mystery and you keep seeing the same patterns repeated or you keep seeing the same names, then that perhaps will be significant. So we will see how we go. So I am confident I'm going to be able to make the lady appear eventually. Uh, Linda has very red hair, which again sounds very, um, very tenuous, but you never know. And uh, we've been on Radio Essex talking about this. We've spoken about Carl Dernan. He was such a character. Six children, three wives, I think. Um, the wife in England and Carol, they didn't, Carol didn't know her father was Carl Dernan. She thought he was her stepfather and only found out later and went in search of him with a name and struggled to find him in America even with a name. So here we are many years later, able to get so much further without a name at the beginning, it's amazing. So I think for Linda, we can make the lady appear, but we just need to do a bit more work. And if anyone has any thoughts about whether or not the Sears might be involved, that was the other thing that I thought. Um, and I've done a tree for them, and I don't think that they have any skin in the game, but one of the thoughts that went through my head was, could their daughter have become pregnant? And I know what, Mr. Sears will come up with an idea that we've seen a lady outside, and you know, that's, that's another, another theory. So Linda and I have been on ITV News talking about this, we've been on Radio Essex. We're trying to bring the message to the wider public that this really works, you can really do this, you can really solve mysteries that have baffled Scotland Yard with genetic genealogy and the ancestry uh, DNA database family tree in 23 and May. I think the sad thing is, I think if we were doing this 20 years ago, we, we would be um, much better served because there would be elderly ladies with long memories that said, I remember Carl Dernan. Anyone that can stage manage things and get nurses to go outside and find gooseberry bushes, he was charming the ladies, um, I'm sure, in, in the area uh, years before. But we're a little bit too late for that. But who knows, maybe once we know who uh, the key players are in this, and if they are from Peterborough, and who the great grandparents are and grandparents, we, we can appeal as we need to, and it would be wonderful to get some news, um, news for them. So families are a particular passion of mine, as I think you've heard as I've gone through and spoken about um, Linda. And there are many other cases that I'm working on at the moment. Uh, one is the Anthony Ring case that Angie Bush has been, again, very heavily involved with. And um, we are getting very close to solving that particular case, which I think is the most interesting case, at least of the last hundred years, in certainly in this country and i think one of the reasons for that is very briefly althea ring was found on the highest point of steep ground worthy inside a gooseberry bush not gooseberry bush I'm, i've got those on the brain now this is a blackberry bush blackberry bush and gooseberry bushes are the 
it certainly seemed to feature, but in this case it was a blackberry bush. She was found inside a blackberry bush, not stage managed in this case. I don't think Carl Denham could have been involved because it, we're talking 1937 here, uh, so before the Americans came. So what was, a, what was a child doing inside a blackberry bush? And at the time Scotland Yard got involved, they brought bloodhounds onto the downs, they searched, Eight officers worked for six months on this case. Nobody could do anything. So along comes genetic genealogy, along come databases, um, with Andrew's help. We, we, we know, well, we knew pretty quickly that she was an Irish child. An Irish child, five generations deep, full way in there. Uh, then we got to grandparents, great grandparents. Then we got to grandparents, again, with Andrew's help. And, and now I think it's fair to say that we're a few steps away from parents, really for her, which is just fantastic. She's a fantastic lady. And to be able to give her her history and to try and explain in some way how she came to be where she was, all she wants to know her names and why. So if you were a family back in the 1700s, uh, philanthropic sea captain Thomas Coram set up the Fowling Hospital. That I love the, you would be left at the time with a token that would be redeemed and then you would come together with your parents. But it was, it was not a case of anyone could turn up. At first, it was first come, first serve, but then they were back in time, overwhelmed. And you had to draw a ball from a bag. A black ball meant sorry, no room at the inn. A red ball meant you were on the waiting, no, a black ball meant no room at the inn. A red ball meant awaiting this situation, and a white ball meant you were in. Um, so, yes, a difficult situation there. And it ran for many years. And, the entry criteria changed, but there was a place you could go. So what does it mean to be a family? Richard Redgrave painting here, the outcast. Um, I'm quite interested in the whole concept of the fallen woman and um, how women have suffered and, and families have suffered through the years when men appear to get to the way spot free. And again, it's wonderful that we can now do some good here and actually really begin to reunite people that were in these situations with, with families. Um, here you've got the stern patriarch banishing his daughter with a letter lying on the floor with incriminating evidence, which is a little bit like Augustus Egg and some of his paintings that have the same sort of method here of showing the sort of stern morality and how women must be punished for transgression. So definitely we can now help these people, and to me that's just incredibly powerful. And we've got so many cases that we're running at the moment as well. So that's just one of them, the Anthony case, we've got the Linda Wright case. There's a case of um, a gentleman called Robert Weston who was left in the cinema in 1956. We now have in part solved that case, and he was left during the Ten Commandments was quite just extraordinary. He was left in a cloakroom during the Ten Commandments. You've got all the long traditions of families. You've got Fielding, Fielding's Tom Jones, you've got Romulus and Remus, all of these right from the beginning of time in art and literature. You've got Jack Worthing and the importance of being earnest. And just now if we can begin to give them their heritage, their name and life, I think is unbelievable. Well thank you very much for coming along and listening today. I don't know if you've got any questions for me or any thoughts about the, um, the story as told um, that I may have overlooked. That would be great. great, thanks very, very much. Um, how, how many cases, uh, how many foundlings cases do you work on every year, roughly? Oh, goodness, I've, got, I've probably got about 50 cases at the moment. 50? Yeah, all wow. of, not all of them I can work continually. I, um, I do it all pro uh, bono, so that way I'm not beholden to anyone, but I, all, all the spare time I can give, I do. And there's certain ones that are uh, ahead at the top of the list. I think Anthea, um, Anthea Ring has, has been incredibly difficult, and I'm, and I'm just so excited that we're so close. We started out with, with poor matches for that one, and we've managed to get closer and closer and closer. And that's, you know, so good for them. So yes, probably 50, um, with probably 10 that I'm actively working. And um, we had one where a baby, I was mentioned to you earlier, where 
we had a child that was left um, at the station that served Crystal Palace called Juanita, with Juanita written on her, who's partly Indian and Greek Italian. And at the moment, I think that's the only, only case that I'm, I think will be very, very difficult and we're really depending on depending on India opening up and getting more representation over there. But who knows in time, you know, any of these things can be solved in their time. It's, it's a bit like cracking a safe, because I think it's a, you know, there was a safe cracker that I heard interviewed somewhere and he said, I can crack any safe, some take longer than others. And I think it's a, it's a that's definitely true. And I think as, as time goes on, the databases are getting bigger and bigger all the time. You know, uh, I think in last year, Ancestry passed 3 million. I think 23andMe is coming up to 2 million. And so there's, they're constantly growing all the time. And we always say to adoptees as well as families to test in all three databases. I think that's important. And I think as well, you need to use elbow grease. I think a lot of people think, and they may not have the time, because it is very time consuming. But it isn't a passive process. I think that's something that it, I, I hear when I listen to radio interviews or someone's a family and I say, well, it just depends on a lucky match. And I'm thinking, you know, out here, we, you know, I'm with luck and a good win behind us. We're going to be able to tell her who her parents are. If she'd been sitting waiting for eight matches to come on, we've been waiting for a long time. Um, but she, you know, it's, it's looking at what's there and it's making some deductions, going and getting some help. There are a lot of people out there that will help you. And, uh, you know, that too. So, but you're right. And in England, we're seeing a massive rise in the, the growth, particularly before it was just generally America. That, that's what I was going to ask you, actually, because I think, certainly from my own experiences, in the last year or so, I'm getting a lot more closer matches than I would do previously. Is that your experience as yes, well? Yes, definitely, definitely, definitely. I think, I think there's more positive publicity now, there's more going on. Here, it's very interesting coming here this year. As soon as, I mean, on the bus and the way in from the car park, people are talking about DNA, DNA in the bus. That wasn't happening a year ago. So I think people in England are beginning to, to realise that, that they can do this. Um, and that it's meaningful and positive. And I think it would be more, people like easy wins. So I think as the database grows and they begin to think, oh my goodness, there, there's my name and there's my, thing, there's my town. It will, it will be more meaningful. Questions, questions for Julia? We have a question down here. Do you use get match at all? Yes. Yes. I think that's a short answer. That's a sort of a, how do you describe that as a third party site, I guess, where you can upload your, your raw data um, and it has some tools there. So if you want to use a chromosome browser to compare and to do, then you can, yes, you can do that. Yes, I do use it. Um, just extends the database size, I guess, by using... Pardon, sorry, I can't hear you. It extends the database size if you use GitMatch. So if everybody's doing three lots of DNA, that's all on that okay, side. Okay, I can hear anyway. database size, but that's all I can like hear, sorry. So it, uh, the, the, the comment was it extends the database size, um, which is absolutely true, because GetMatch is uh, a free website that it allows you to upload whatever DNA uh, data that you have from whatever company it is, whether it's Ancestry, Family Tree DNA, or 23andMe, you can upload it to GetMatch. I think at the last count they had 200,000 people in the database, roughly about 200. It might have gone up a little bit since then, but these are people who would be uh, computer savvy enough to actually upload their data, number one. And because they're interested in, in doing so, you're more likely to get a response from them. Whereas, for example, if you if anyone's tested with 23andMe, you'll know that a lot of the people there are interested in the medical risk aspect of the DNA rather than the genealogy side. It's difficult to get a uh, an answer out of them a lot of the time. Another question here. Where's the best place to go to for somebody to look at your results to try and find a parent on the Y? DNA side, if, you know, like I don't understand enough about it to be able to make matches back further. Okay, so you're saying the question would be, just to clarify, where should you go if you want to, if you didn't know who your parents were, what would be the first step? Is that what you're asking? Or? He's done the Y-DNA. Oh, your, your husband or your um, a father-in-law. Yeah, okay, yeah, and he's on the way, and he's looking for his parents or his father? father. Okay, yes. And on FTDNA, he got somebody that he's two, uh, two, genera two generations set 
a, a two-step genetic distance on his Y DNA. Yeah. So how, how would who would he go? Who would you go to to get an interpretation of your DNA results? Um, if you are an adoptee or looking for someone who was a, uh, for the parents of someone okay. who was adopted. If you, so if there's a question, there there are various different groups on Facebook you can look at. Um, you've got uh, ISOG, you've got DNA detectives. There are various different places, and if he if he posts clearly exactly what he's found, what his questions are, then that might be a starting point. But there are lots of there's lots of help out there. If you have a look on that, I think that's right, Morris. I mean, what would you? Yeah. Are Are you actually on Facebook? Yeah. Well, the... he would like to know who his father is, but doesn't do want to do the work. He'd like me to do the work side okay. of it. So. so Typical man. Ancestry pro pro genealogy yeah pro genealogists yeah there yeah. There, there are there are people that you can pay to do the research but if he hasn't tested his ancestry and if he's on family tree DNA then then that would be I think I think some men if they're looking for a father that, that have read about Y DNA may think oh well I'll just go and get my Y DNA tested and and that won't is unlikely to be enough on its own so going to somewhere like ancestry DNA um, and having a look there. Building a tree wide and deep for the lines that you do know and the sides that you do know, um, and then you might spot who the maternal matches are with a bit of legwork over at Ancestry. And then, I mean, I'm I'm, I'm working a case at the moment where somebody's father uh, was handed over um, to somebody, some stranger at a station or something, and didn't know who father father was. And because they have a very full tree around everything that they do know this is the missing section i can see immediately we're looking at we're looking for ireland again it's uh, it's up there so dad was irish I, i'm pretty sure but i wouldn't have known that if i was just looking at y dna alone it's all you know that that would have given me some information and have been a tool but, but you need to be in all three fours don't you as well yeah. really ideally absolutely and there is um a specific project on family tree dna called the adopted project so you should join him up to that. He's got his Y DNA. So you should join the adopted project. There's also on Facebook, like like Julia says, DNA detectives is one. There's also uh, there's, Debbie knows a few of these. Yes. So I'm going to get Debbie to tell us. I'm just going to say we have the DNA Help for Genealogy group on Facebook, and Don and Rutherford, who is the admin of that group, is here in the audience today, and she's always very helpful. Her and Seth will answer any questions in that group. Like two thousand, is it? There's two thousand people in that group. So um, again, it's manned by volunteers. Many of them are uh, members of the International Society of Genetic Genealogy. That's somebody else you should join today as well, and go onto the ISOC Facebook group as well. With thirteen thousand members on the ISOC Facebook group, if you ask a question, you usually get an answer in the next five minutes. So it's a great place to actually start. There's a lot of support there from the community, by the community. Any other questions? We have another question down here. Hello. Um, have you tested Carol for her mitochondrial DNA? Um, I'm waiting on the results on that. So yes, I'm not Carol, um, Linda. Yeah, Linda, it gets confusing because there's so many, there's six children out there, but yes. Yes, I have, and I'm waiting on the results. That. So I'm, I'm getting everything I possibly can for her, and we'll be we'll be having a look and um, seeing what we can do. And I, I'm confident we'll, we'll get there in the end. Especially, also we can take away Carl's side of things from the results and see what we see what's left. What, what happens to foundlings now? I mean, presumably we still have foundlings in modern society that are from time yes. to time left outside the church doors or under a blackberry bush as well. But what actually happens to foundlings now? Well, I think I think they've been sort of taken in by social services, probably all of those things. I mean, there was a case recently. I think Debbie, you, we 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 discussed it at one point, whereby um, somebody's uh, I think the police criminal DNA database. So there was a, a lady who had, had gone on there um, and had they were they were able to basically reunite the foundling with its mother with DNA through the police criminal DNA database, which is something to be separate. Um, but obviously technology has come in now where if someone's just left in the middle of a field or something, they'll, they'll, take, they'll, they'll look at DNA. Um, 
um, and that may provide an answer within the criminal uh, database context. So we've come a long way since Andrew and the bloodhounds now for people, but I think they get absorbed into the system and generally. Um, but generally, I suppose back in the past when a foundling was left in, they'd stay in that institution for a certain amount of time. I think varied. I mean, there, there was a home that quite a few people that I'm helping all ended up at the same time. And that's been fantastic because, oh my goodness, you were there too at my, my, at my uh, DNA day. They, the families were talking to each other and they realised they'd all been in the, in the same nursery together. And well, Anthea's story was heart-wrenching in the sense of, you know, asked about what happened to families. Well, then in 1937, Everyone was asked to write into the paper if they wanted Anthony. He wrote in and he, whoever told the most tragic and harrowing tale got them. Not quite, uh, as she went to fantastic people, but they'd sadly lost their daughter who got killed, killed in a car accident, their only daughter age seven. So they were deemed to be the most worthy and deserving cause. And she went to them. And as it turned out, she couldn't have gone to better people, so it was fantastic. But I can't imagine that happening now. So that's what happened then. Any, yes, we have one from Donna. Julia, I've got a friend who's a foundling and I've offered to help her um, try and find out who her parents are and what happened to her. But she's really quite scared about starting the process. How did Linda cope? Did she have some quite emotional times? Or yeah, it's, it, is, it is very um, harrowing and very, very difficult for people to be on this journey. And I think, I mean, I don't claim to be able to understand all the emotions but because my mother went through her whole life not knowing who her father is I think that echoes that have felt down through the generations to me and to other children of people that have been in unknown parentage situations which is why it's great to have a support group and I think families particularly I think I, mean, I can't speak for them but I think in the community I think they felt that there was nothing for them whenever they went to adoption society uh, gatherings Nobody can help a family because there's no information at all. So there's no chance of beyond appealing and appealing. But to be honest, sometimes that can be counterproductive. And I think sometimes it's better to try and... You know, there are cases that I don't talk about. There are cases which are incredibly private and, and we've been successful for that reason. Um, and, out, and other times where people, where all people who are, you know, the horses in the race are, are deceased, it, it feels more ethical to be able to have a conversation because they're not alive. But, it's yes, it's it's a highly charged and, and very something that you have to be. You can't be. It's not like called it the lazy vanishes and you know and Hitchcock. I, I am very sensitive about how people feel and try to do my best by them. Um, you know, I'm not qualified in the area and refer them to professionals where they need to. But, but that, that, that's a good point, and I think yes, it is highly charged for everybody involved. Do you find that in your in your work as well? I'm sure. Yeah, it can be. I think the first time I had to tell somebody that their mother wasn't or their father wasn't their father was really quite upsetting, and um, I took it all private and helped as much as I could. But I did feel a little bit like I don't know what to do. It's, I don't know what to do next for these people, and there, there there's been some really tough stories. I think there's a very important point to remember because um, a lot of people, especially when you see long lost family on the television, you think every story ends with a happy ending. But you have to remember that with foundlings, with adoptees as well, the start in life was a traumatic start. You know, either the, 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 the mother must have been trauma traumatized, and certainly for the foundling, where the, it's usually presumably the mother that actually delivers the baby to. The, the stairs outside the church or whatever it has to be very very traumatic for the mother as well and um, it's important probably to go into these cases in the knowledge that you're actually going into a traumatic event I think so I think you have to be very thoughtful and mindful of that and, and to have an open mind and not to be judgmental in any in any way because the grace of God goes go many of us oh, absolutely. So it's, uh, we never really understand the circumstances either. It's very easy to judge. Even some of the GI cases where they haven't perhaps behaved as well as we might hope they would. Post-traumatic stress disorder, as in for my own grandfather. Um, undiagnosed and people, people with personal battles we know nothing about. As a matter of interest, how many people have adoptions in their family tree? I know that I have two adoptions in my family tree. <laughs> one from 1946, one from 1920s. 
And how many people have foundlings in their family tree? Just the one. Okay. Um, question over here from, or it's a comment from Debbie and one from Angie as well. Just a quick question about the legal status, because I understand that a woman who abandons a baby is actually considered as a criminal That's by the right. law. So, it, with historical cases, would the police still actually prosecute the woman if a woman was found and identified? That's, and that, that's, a, that's, a, that's a really good point, and that was what motivated Kate Aiden to write her book. Um, she wrote a book about exactly that, and how she thought that that legislation was outdated and should be repealed. From what I know, I think it's highly unlikely that anyone would be prosecuted, but I don't quote me on that. But I think it does still stand to a certain extent, and I think it has put people off. It's put people off coming forward, like a, a case, the 1971 case that I'm working. I think it's very difficult, and you're fearful anyway, and you feel shame, shame, and all sorts of things sometimes. And I think that's a good point. So I think to go, it's 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 a worry for some. I think to be honest with you, I think most people are unaware that it's a criminal offence that have done this, but. But for others, it's um, it's it's something that I think has prevented them from coming forward, and I think that's something that Kate Lady felt very strongly about and wanted to do something around. But I don't think that anything has particularly changed. But I think I might be wrong, but my feeling is it's fairly toothless le legislation. I don't think I don't think a woman would have a book the book thrown at them. But again. Don't quote me on that. And I, can't, I can't think of an occasion where it's really happened, in my knowledge, where anyone has been prosecuted. I'm, I'm, I'm probably telling me that there has been. But, um. Just a quick comment. Um, somebody said, you know, how you convince them to test if they're a foundling or adopted. How do you convince them to test? I would say unequivocally, you don't convince them. They need to be ready. They need to drive that search, and they need to be 100% ready for it. Because even in the best of situations, when you're 100, you think you're 100% prepared, there will be things that you are just not prepared to deal with. Yeah, I think I think that's a good point, and I think it's for example, I'm just I'm doing someone who is a celebrity, but they're a friend of mine that I've known them 25 years. They've asked me to to do something for them. And um, I haven't got legal paperwork that I signed, but I've said, when you do this as well, you need to be absolutely open-minded and absolutely clear that you may find something that, that, you, that you don't want to find. So yes, I think it's clear. I think you have to be very clear with people. Um, and of course, you know, you can't force them to do things. But for many, it's a win-win as well. They are, they are getting some fantastic information there too. But, but I think to be ethical and to be clear, important points. Great. Okay, well, well, we'll have to call it a day there, but um, can I just ask you to show your appreciation for Julia Bell? Thanks very much, Julia.